Hello, I'm Eric Topol, Editor-in-Chief of Medscape. And if I ever was excited to have someone to interview, it would be Dr. Magdalena Skipper, uh, Editor-in-Chief of Nature. Welcome, Ma Magdalena. Hello, Eric. It's very nice to be here. Thank you for this opportunity. I thought because a lot of our uh, listeners uh, are uh, physicians and may not be so familiar with nature or, or your uh, heritage, I thought I'd just briefly review. You have a bit, been a, a, a background in genetics and geneticist uh, uh, at University of Nottingham and your PhD at Cambridge. You worked with model organisms like worms and zebrafish. And then for most of the last two decades, you've been at nature one place or another, nature genetics, nature uh, review genetics, nature communications. And then last year, the first uh, woman editor of nature in 149 years. So congratulations on that. Thank you. So what was it like to take on the, the most highly regarded journal in life science and in science in general? Well, um, you know, your, your question in many ways um, points at the answer. It is, of course, an, a tremendous honor to, to be in this role. Um, it's a tremendous sense of responsibility for so many different reasons. Um, you know, just to name one, this year you, you mentioned already I'm uh, the first woman to be editor-in-chief in the 149 years of the history of nature. In fact, this year we're celebrating its 150th anniversary. And to, to think about that history, that, that heritage, and, and actually quite a wonderful um, transition that nature has gone through over the years, working together with research communities as they themselves have changed, we have changed enormously. And you know, in all that time, actually, I'm only the eighth editor-in-chief of the journal, which is really quite remarkable. It is. So there's, yeah. there's, there's really, you know, something quite, um, uh, quite special about this role and about that sense of um, duty and custodianship, that when you come into the role, you really want to stay. You really want to make sure that you do a good job um, because of that responsibility. And I mentioned one of the reasons, and of course that, that's the heritage, but of course another one is not so much looking at the past, but looking at the present and into the future. You know, one of the things that, um, that has always driven us at Nature uh, right from the very beginning is actually encapsulated in, um, in our mission statement. And so the key word for me in that mission statement is that we are here to serve. And, and of course, the, then, then it's incumbent on me to make sure that the journal and the wonderful colleagues I work with, um, that we do actually serve the various research communities um, in the best possible ways. So it's, um, it's a tremendous honor, tremendous responsibility, um, a little daunting as well, but, I would uh, think so. but well, very exciting. Well, you're not only, you know, have this um, heritage, but you also are a, really a model for all the other scientific journals in, in so many respects. So I guess maybe you start off is, what, what, let's, uh, a topic I know you're into, success and, and failure uh, in science. Yeah. Could, you, could you tell me more about your thoughts on that? Yes. So, you know, this is very interesting. I, as you can imagine, I've been thinking a lot about this, not just um, now that I'm in the role of editor-in-chief of Nature, but actually throughout my initially research career, but, but especially throughout my career as, as an editor. Uh, you know, I spent a number of years on Nature itself as a genetics and genomics editor, of course, making decisions on manuscripts, evaluating them, and often Nature and similar journals um, are uh, considered, or publishing in those journals is considered synonymous with success. In, in science. This is a very narrow definition of success. And, and, and when I think about success in science or research more broadly, um, I think about the various contributions that researchers make to the research community and the scientific process. And without these various contributions, the system wouldn't work. Um, we only actually evaluate and take into account a very narrow aspect of those contributions, namely typically publications. It's gratifying to see that more and more people who are part of the research ecosystem are thinking carefully about how to broaden that consideration 
so you know the kinds of things that I'm talking about that by and large go unnoticed are of course mentorship in in science um, that um, desire for um, excellence in scholarship so really placing attention uh, paying attention to how research is done in the most rigorous way with that integrity that, that really actually you know, by and large all scientists have uh, but they're not necessarily appreciated for and necess not necessarily awarded for. Uh, of course um, uh, peer review itself contributing to um, building and um, uh, perfecting if you like the, the scholarly output and, and scholarly publication record and then last and definitely not least um, are different types of outputs from from scientific research so um, let's say you know um, sharing data sharing um, code uh, material protocols reagents etc etc something that fortunately we uh, talk about increasingly frequently um, especially in life sciences actually um, but until recently it essentially went um, underappreciated throughout uh, the, the scientific community. So collectively, all these different elements have to come to play, I think, when we think about success in research, um, as I say, or in science. As I say, um, many others, not just me, of course, many others are beginning to think about how to surface those different contributions. Right. Um, and, you know, even in the even in the realm of publishing itself, um, one of the things that, that um, piqued my interest recently, I've been thinking about it for a while, but there was a, a lovely example of it uh, at Nature, actually, that we published the other day. You know, we almost universally um, equate having to retract a paper with um, a form of failure in, in, in science or in research. But it doesn't really have to be. Um, somehow, especially in the public eye, science has become this sort of infallible process, which of course we know it isn't. There is plenty of room for uh, genuine, honest mistakes or incorrect mm -hmm. conclusions, which as long as they are corrected, um, then a part and parcel of the process. In fact, we have a saying, we talk about um, uh, science being a self-correcting process. And on the one hand, while well, we say it, on the other hand, we have sort of forgotten about it, forgotten to, uh, to appreciate it. And, and somehow the, the prevailing wind is towards stigmatizing retractions. And so the reason why I say this is because um, we had a, a wonderful example of this in nature, not in life sciences, actually was in, a, in, in climate change, in the field of climate change, where um, uh, a manuscript we published um, uh, some months ago um, ended up being retracted because the authors mistakenly used a data set for the analyses, which was actually inappropriate. They, they actually mis, mis, mistook that analysis, the data set for something else. Um, so we retracted the paper, but they subsequently repeated the analyses with the correct data, and we ended up republishing a paper which we previously retracted. And um, I found this example very interesting because it illustrates how transparency and honesty and, and real focus on what we're trying to discover um, in the end leads us to, to a happy ending and, and a successful mm -hmm. outcome. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's a great example. And also that it's not really a binary story of success and failure. It really is a continuum. Right. Yeah, those, those are really uh, instructive. Now, it's 150 years into nature. It's perhaps yes. the most exciting time ever in, in science, uh, especially in life science with things like genome editing, the gut microbiome, and there's just so much going on. So how do you try to uh, capture that, not go too fast, uh, not to avoid the concerns of replication and, uh, of, of course, trying to capture the things that are most interesting. What's the right balance with all that? Hmm. Uh, an excellent question and, and of course a very important task that the excellent team of editors I work with um, you know grapple with on, on their daily basis and, and we do it on an individual basis when, when we uh, each one of us um, reads manuscripts and makes those decisions 
but then also we do it collectively as a team, trying to think about the direction in which we're going. And, you know, the balance is struck in, in many ways. And of course, uh, so the way we work at Nature is um, we have a collection of um, individual professional editors who uh, devote the 100% of the time to um, reading manuscripts, evaluating them, staying in touch with the community, working with the community, for example, to establish maybe standards um, on how to report on the work that is done and, and many other things. Um, we, um, we indeed consider papers on many different um, levels and for many different reasons. Um, some examples are um, let's say, just to take a few examples that you mentioned, like genome editing or the microbiome, we, look, we may look at some of these uh, submitted manuscripts from a perspective of potential um, therapeutic or medical or diagnostic application. Some other of these papers may be considered purely on the basis of fundamental insights that they provide into the biology. Let's say in the case of genome editing, it may be something to do something fundamental about um, DNA repair, for example. Or in the case of microbiome, it may be something fundamental about uh, microbial ecology. And it just happens to be, let's say, in the context of the human microbiome. It may, of course, be in other contexts. Um, one of the things that um, I personally have always loved about the things that we consider at Nature something which is underappreciated. So many out there think that we just go after um, particularly striking stories that maybe, you know, will we'll catch the headlines. But that is actually not the whole truth. One of the things that we editorially feel very strongly about, and I personally feel very strongly about, is that we try to focus on the elegance of science. Science is really elegant. The, 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 the method can be so, sometimes very simple set of experiments and very simple way of dissecting a problem can be truly elegant and satisfying. And trying to find those papers and find space for them um, you know, is, is a real quest for, for the editors. And I can tell you from the time when I used to handle papers myself, when papers like this come along, and as an editor, I was able to shepherd them through peer review and, and publish them, there's a real personal satisfaction that, that comes out of this. And, and you may or may not know this, but um, editors talk about the papers they publish as their papers. Right? Oh, so right, right. Clearly, yeah. clearly, we're not yeah. the authors, <laughs> but, but we say these are our papers. This is the paper right. I published. This is my paper. That, that's the level of um, you know, almost um, uh, possessiveness and yeah. pride in those topics. But that elegance, so, so a mixture of these elements that we look for, you know, of course, we're also interested in, in resources um, that, that we can publish, present for the community out there. And actually, any of these categories that I mentioned apply just as readily to life sciences as they do to physical sciences. Of course, nature is a multidisciplinary uh, journal. To begin with, uh, for many years, I would say easily a century, we were focusing almost exclusively on what I called hardcore natural sciences, so basic sciences. Um, but increasingly, we are looking beyond that um, definition, looking at much more applied sciences, so translational research, going all the way in the direction of the clinical we're more interested within the physical sciences space. We're more interested in, in applied um, papers going towards engineering and, and increasingly actually in papers which have an aspect of social sciences, in part because of course the wonderful which, thing which we witness these days is, is the fact that science and research, they have become so much more multidisciplinary and, and these rigid distinctions which we once had are really disappearing and, and that's one of the exciting things that that we've seen in in recent decades sure well i also just uh point out i love your description of elegant science and it makes me think about those last mile experiments the the uh, drilling mm -hmm. down on on this to get the the uh, clever you know way to get to the answer to, you know testing the hypothesis fully so right. 
um, I, I think that's that's great you point that out and how editors um, handling papers are advocates and uh, as you say they feel a sense of real ownership it's great now this uh, other part of this 150 years is that everything is is going through a shakeup uh, you've been an advocate of preprint and now you know everything not everything but so many things are getting posted as preprints before they even get submitted uh, how do you balance that whole world with the idea that you want to have it peer reviewed and you know before it's it's uh, fully disseminated mm. so you know for us um, we're in a very interesting position here because of course preprints to us and and as a reminder nature is a multidisciplinary journal for us preprints are far from new um, physical sciences um, not right across the board but large swathes of physical sciences invented preprints and adopted them uh, some 25 years ago now so archive itself uh, the first uh, preprint server has been around for as I say something like 25 years and so right from the, from the very start, um, Nature um, was um, embracing preprints as, um, as sort of a complementary um, way, complementary way of disseminating scientific information that went side by side with, um, let's call it traditional, uh, peer-reviewed, journal-focused uh, publishing. And so, you know, Nature, my, my predecessor and, and um, just about the predecessor before him, because my predecessor was in his role for 22 years, um, certainly editorialized about the importance of preprints in the physical sciences community. So when life sciences, and more recently, increasingly other fields, including um, uh, the clinical sphere, have begun to adopt preprints, um, for us, this really was just an extension of something that we were doing already. One thing that has changed for us, actually, relatively recently, um, we um, editorialized about it about two months ago or so. So while all these years um, we've been supporting preprints, we actually now actively encouraging our authors to deposit their work as a preprint on a server of their choice. Um, the reason for this is that, of course, you know, preprints. Um, I, I really do feel that preprints have offer a kind of synergy to, to the, the traditional publishing of, of research. So first of all, it's that immediate dissemination of, of a result. So you're sharing it without um, uh, withholding it while it's undergoing peer review in, in a journal of your choice. Um, but secondly, and importantly, something that I think not all communities have taken advantage of, but some have. So, the deposition of preprint allows you to get feedback from your broader community. Of course, all researchers, um, all those who publish papers, um, solicit some feedback from their colleagues uh, at some point before um, they share the, the paper with the journals or with, um, uh, with the wider community. But, um, but depositing preprints allows that exposure to a broad community um, for comments, be they on the preprint server or in private by email with, um, with the author. Now, the other part that's uh, also going through uh, a change is the migration to open access. More journals are open access. At the same time, we've got predatory journals. We've got, we've got a lot of things going on here. How, how is that going to sort out over time? Well, um, very clearly, the first thing I will say is I very much hope that predatory journals will disappear as quickly as they appeared. Right. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier that um, indeed I've been an editor for almost 20 years now. And um, that upsurge in predatory journals is something that we have seen only relatively recently. And, and the really unfortunate thing that it is coincident with the widespread interest and support in open access. Um, uh, this is, of course, unfortunate because in some communities, it creates an impression that open access is somehow associated with 
lower quality, which of mm -hmm. course, most emphatically, should have nothing to do with right. it. It's right. a completely independent variable, it, it ought to be. Um, but it is indeed a, an unfortunate association. So I do hope that these predatory journals are going to disappear and a number of um, uh, ev um, events, I suppose, are, um, are helping uh, that to, to come about. And you know, things like Beale's List, which was quite popular, unfortunately disappeared at some point, the general awareness in the community, exchanging information about which journals and how to identify a bona fide journal, a journal that is indexed in various indices. Um, I think that's an important awareness that, that um, the communities should um, invest more time and effort in and exchange information um, within, within their circles. Now, with respect to open access itself, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about open access which is important. I would love us to talk about open research, which to me is a much broader umbrella mm -hmm. under which open access sits. But if we truly use the arguments which are so often used uh, to support open access, if we truly care about the general public having access to the results of uh, the scientific endeavor, if, if the funders truly care about um, getting the greatest value for, for the money that they invest in, in research, then it's not just the words that need to be shared, it's actually all the other uh, research objects, as they are sometimes called. So the data, the code, the protocols, the methods, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I think it's a, it's a really important move uh, that we're heading towards. Um, I will be honest and say that most of the general public actually want what, what may be called um, public access. Mm -hmm. So strictly speaking, open ac when we talk about open access, we mean uh, publications which are not just free to read, but they're also published under Creative Commons license, So, right. which implies, of course, a level of reusability. This in itself, I think, is very important to the research community, uh, but to the general public, I think they want access to information. They are, they're probably less likely in most cases to want to reuse that information. It's a technicality, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, from this perspective, for example, um, many tend to forget that nature at this point in time can be publicly accessed. Uh, we have a number of years actually ago, we developed um, a tool called ShareDid, which allows um, um, unlimited sharing of um, uh, a link to a completely freely accessible uh, version of every manuscript which is published in Nature. Um, it's not something you can save on your desktop, on your computer, um, but it's something you can share on social media with anybody else. So anybody can access these papers. I emphasize they're not open access in that sense that uh, they're not published under Creative Commons uh, license, but that's, that's in Nature itself. Of course, Nature Research uh, publishes um, other journals which are open access in that traditional sense. Uh, you mentioned I, before coming into this role, I was editor in chief of Nature Communications, which is an open access sure, sure. Um, nature title. Um, but I do think, you know, in general, um, I feel very strongly that openness and transparency is something that um, science, research um, can only benefit from. It's something that I advocate within the research community, but I also advocate it internally for us. I would like us to be more transparent and more open, um, both in the sense of transparency of our processes, but also more open um, in the sense of, of what we publish. Uh, there is a subset of papers which we publish um, open access, and we have been publishing under Creative Commons for, for many years now, and of course, those papers come from the field that is perhaps closest to my heart, and that's genetics and genomics. And that community really established um, itself as the, the front runner in, in this effort, of course, with, with the Human Genome Project, uh, almost 20 years ago now. So um, uh, it's, it's an interesting challenge for us also, because nature is such a selective journal 
You know, we, we only publish something like seven or eight percent of manuscripts which are submitted to us, right. um, which makes that calculation of having to charge authors who publish with us for um, all the effort that we put into evaluating on these different manuscripts. Um, it makes it makes it difficult for us to, to make the calculation work perhaps simply because it's such a small proportion of those authors who are successful to publish in their pages. But that, that is that that strong selectivity is indeed what, what makes nature what it is today and, and has been for, for many years. Well, you know, I think this point that you're making about the openness it extends far beyond access and it, it, about data sharing, about code, about you know, the, the whole data sets, everything else is important. The other thing is that uh, this idea that uh, the open uh, access uh, is simulated by things like ReCube and mm -hmm. other browsers, where the, the person who is interested uh, doesn't have to own the PDF, but can access and read the contents of the paper. I think it's an excellent model. Now, a big topic that you have been an advocate of, and I think you were, when you came to our conference here at Scripps uh, some years ago, uh, mm -hmm. you kind of uh, electrified the group, uh, the audience, because you talked about how important it is for scientists and researchers to be able to communicate to the public. And I know this mm -hmm. is an important topic for you. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, with pleasure. Um, it is an important topic for me. And, and let me just put it in, in context, because it may be a little bit surprising for me to be talking about it as editor-in-chief of Nature, most of Nature's audience is actually that of researchers. So the research community is, is our main, our primary audience. Although, of course, the magazine part of Nature with its news section and opinion section is targeted at a, actually at an interested lay audience. So, so we, we, the way we write in that section of the journal um, we don't necessarily, in fact, we don't write for the specialists. We, we require some appreciation of, of the science, but certainly not specialist knowledge. Nevertheless, the primary target audience of nature is, of course, the research community itself. Still, we live in the age when, very unfortunately, um, experts and their importance and the value is questioned. Um, we live in, live in the age when facts themselves are being challenged. Um, and this is a, an incredibly worrying trend, um, a trend which I believe um, can be solved, not completely, but in, la by in, a, large, uh, in a large part helped um, uh, by, or, or, or rather prevention of the, of the progression of this trend, can be helped by researchers themselves engaging with the general public to um, talk about the discoveries, to talk about implications of their work, and to demystify, and by demystifying how that research is done. You know, earlier I was alluding to the fact that science itself is not infallible. And one of the, one of the um, arguments in this sort of counterfact uh, discourse is well, scientists themselves don't know what the truth is because one day they think this and another thing they, they think that. Well, if we can explain the process that it's, you know, science is not a religion, there's not a dogma as such, um, although we use that terminology, but of course we use it in a different sense, but it's, it's, a, it's an evolving process. Every day we think we've solved a problem and we have a picture, a complete picture of something and the next day some new uh, finding emerges which actually changes our position or, or influences our view of something which we previously thought was sewn up and, and, and already solved, which of course is part of the beauty of science and, and the whole endeavor. So that's why I feel so strongly that, that researchers should be taking this opportunity to communicate with the general public. And they do much more than they used to. Certainly when I was in the lab, you know, some 20 years ago, um, there was a very different sense of um, that duty in front of the general public, how important it was to communicate your research. And you know, the, the, the sad favorite example of mine 
is actually genetically modified organisms in Europe in particular. In North America, the climate uh, surrounding that particular topic is a little different. But in Europe, the whole argument of the importance and the safety of genetically modified organisms has been lost. And, and unfortunately, I really hope I am wrong here, but unfortunately, I think we have lost this argument irretrievably. Uh, for example, you may or may not realize that le recent legislation in Europe um, ruled that um, genetically engineered, so pre ge genome precision engineered uh, plants will be uh, will will fall under the same legislation as transgenic plants. Mm. So even that precision, very high precision engineering, has not escaped that sort of um, uh, tainted um, assessment uh, in mm. Europe. And you know the, the reason why I think just just to finish that thought on on genetically modified organisms and and the fiasco of communication there. Of course, there were other aspects that played into it. Europe itself may not need genetically modified organisms, but Africa, for example, does. And genetically modified crops are not grown in Africa, in part for economic reasons, because they could not be exported, for example, right. to European countries. So there are very important knock-on effects, global knock-on effects, perhaps not surprisingly. So to come back to communication, so you could say, why is it that scientists themselves, or researchers themselves, should communicate we have plenty of professionals who are science communicators. Well, it turns out when you look at um, a number of surveys that evaluate um, the general public's trust in different professional professions, it turns out that despite all these things I said about um, uh, lack of um, trust in facts, um, some concerns about the importance of experts, scientists and researchers still emerge as one of the most trusted professionals mm -hmm. in these surveys over and over again and actually regardless of where these surveys are conducted so that's quite an interesting mm -hmm. um, and it's a very strong indication because actually the interesting part is if you look at the other end of the scale of these surveys right at the bottom are journalists right so journalists are the ones and and so if if researchers themselves, scientists, whoever engages in, in, in research endeavor, leave that communication to the journalists. Now, I'm not saying that scientists don't have anything to learn from the journalists, but, but that's, another, that's another yeah. matter, right? Yeah. But just leaving it to other professionals, I think is, is missing a trick, is missing an opportunity, um, and, and missing that um, that trust that the public evidently already has um, in researchers. So most emphatically, it is an opportunity. And of course, as always, the, the winning combination is for everyone to work together. So journalists, science communicators, um, as well as researchers working together to, to get those messages across why science and research are important uh, to everyone's lives, not just in the context, for example, of treating of disease, uh, but on, you know, on a daily basis. Um, and, and also explaining, as I said already, explaining how scientific method unfolds, how research is done, how scientists approach questions. And yeah, you know, I think, Madalena, this is so critical because a lot of scientists uh, still are not easy as far as uh, speaking in simple language mm. in terms of communicating to the public uh, in ways that a journalist uh, can uh, and do uh, quite well, and we want to cultivate that. We have so much misinformation from the polluted internet, and, th mm -hmm. and it's far beyond you know anti-vaxxers and climate change de denial, and you know so many topics. And also, of course, the, the person's pride as a scientist is enhanced when they can um, see how they can ignite. Uh, the excitement and enthusiasm about their work to uh, mm -hmm. the public. So there's so many reasons that we want to cultivate that. Now, um, another way that you communicate, which is not shared by lots of other editors of fine scholarly journals, is that you're on Twitter. And I'm, I suspect you also pay attention to alt metrics for the journal. I, I do, uh, yes. Can you, can you comment on both of those? 
Right. So yes, Twitter is, um, you know, to many, Twitter is a bit like Marmite. I don't know whether that comparison, uh, how well it works in, in North America, but certainly here, um, it works very well. So some love it and some hate it, and there are very few who are ambivalent about it. Um, I think you can make a lot of it um, to, to suit, suit your own purpose. So I have only ever used Twitter professionally. I've only ever tweeted as an editor, been part of a scientific community on Twitter. And I personally have benefited, personally professionally have benefited from it enormously. I have learned a lot about the sentiments in the particular research community. To begin with, I was really just part of the, the genetics and genomics community. Now, of course, as editor-in-chief of Nature, a broader community um, uh, of, of researchers and others who are interested in, in this endeavor. Uh, it's a wonderful way of exchanging ideas, um, communicating actually even to the broader um, interested audience. One thing, I don't know if you've noticed this, one thing that has taken off in recent, very recently actually, I would say in the last year, certainly that I've noticed this, is um, sort of creating Twitter threads mm -hmm. of scientific papers. And, you know, it suddenly transpires that because of the figures as they are, as the, the figures themselves, themselves of course tell a story in a paper, so if you reuse the figures and you tweet them and, and insert a sort of intermittent um, uh, tweets to, to help narrate the story, this is a very effective way of synthesizing a message in a paper and delivering it to actually a, a much broader audience. Um, I've also seen um, incredibly interesting, very technical discussions about papers which extend um, the, the scholarship beyond what is present in the paper itself. Interestingly, this is something that journals have tried to achieve for a very long time by offering commenting on the papers oh, right. within the journals, and of course have failed, that never really took off. But on Twitter, that works very, very well. Um, you may remember one example being um, a recent paper in Nature Medicine about um, the um, population genetic study associated with the CCR5 mutation, or variant, I should say, uh, which is associated with um, the variable lifespan. There was a fantastically technical discussion on Twitter. Right. Authors were involved, um, and members of the community were involved, and it was such an enriching experience. So that was really, really valuable. So your second point was about um, old metrics. And of course, this is a wonderful tool. Um, it's a tool which now puts the individual paper, the individual manuscript in the spotlight. So you can, you know, without the, the context of the rest of the journal, doesn't matter where, now all of a sudden doesn't matter, doesn't matter where the paper was published, but the spotlight is on that paper, how well it's been used, how well it's been read, how immediately it has influenced um, the community, whether it's just its own community or a wider community. Uh, so the specific old metric score um, is calculated in a very sophisticated way, which takes into account, for example, whether, let's say, social media activity comes mainly from the immediate circle of the authors and the journal that published the paper, or from a, from a much broader community. And of course, a number of things feed into it. So social media, uh, media coverage, um, increasingly actually impact on policy making mm -hmm. also folds into old metric. So I think it's a very, very valuable, very valuable tool. And um, um, I, I hope that, that all authors are aware of it. Yeah, um, I don't think they are yet. <laughs> I, I, I think so, so certainly we've been using old metrics for many years now and, and report on, on nature and other nature research journals. We report those scores on, on every paper and update them in, in real time. Um, I know that uh, after we introduced it for a long time, authors were not aware. Um, today, I hope the vast majority of authors are aware because it is such a valuable metric of, of how their papers are performing. I should say, performing in the, in the sense of the impact they have, I should say that 
we should remember not to measure all papers with the same yardstick. Um, some papers and some pieces of research will have an immediate effect on the community and you know the, the old metric scores and the like will shoot up and we'll, we'll see them attracting attention immediately. Others are true pioneers over time. So they really take time to mature. That doesn't mean that they are in some way less worthy. Mm -hmm. uh, they can be as important, um, but it simply takes time for whatever reason, because maybe they are so visionary, maybe they are more theoretical, maybe at the time of publication, they're only uh, relevant to one community, but at some point they become relevant to wider community and then that influence becomes extended. So I think we have to be sensitive to these nuances of, of how the different different discoveries that are reported, uh, maybe even different tools and, and different, um, yes, diff different tools are, are um, kind of the influence, how that unfolds over time. Sure. No, I, I certainly see that. And I mean, some of the papers that get the highest alt metric scores are just because they're so controversial rather than they're such great science. And, and also yeah. nature did a a great feature on the Sleeping Beauties uh, that you kind of uh -huh. uh, referred to there. So now I, I could talk to you literally all day because it's so fascinating to have this opportunity, but I want to just hit you with the last question uh, so we can wrap up. And you're the only the eighth editor in 150 years. And let's fast forward, likely you'll be the editor in 20 years hence. <laughs> and I think, and you're still young, you guys, quite likely, I think. But when you finish up your work, whenever that is, it could be 2040, uh, what will you look back and say, um, uh, what, was the, what, what did we do? What, what did we accomplish at a, at a relatively turbulent, challenging time in publishing and science? Hmm. Gosh. Um, now, that is... Um always the most difficult question of them all. Um, and if I may, I will, um, I will share with you an anecdote and I am, I am postponing the answer. I am not escaping it. But, um, but, but let me share a personal anecdote, something that happened in my life when I was very young. And I just simply love this example because it shows you how poor we can be at predicting the future. Um, and so um, I was about 19 at the time, and I was talking to um, a friend of mine who was studying computer science. Um, so um, you um, referred to me as being young. Well, I am not so young. Um, at the age of 19, I was really not familiar with computers at all. Um, I had really main, maybe used one once at, at that point. Um, and so we had this conversation, and I was trying to understand exactly what they were and how they were built and so on. And then at some point, I proclaimed with this great um, you know, wisdom of a 19-year-old that um, um, maybe one day I will use a computer at work, but I really don't think I will ever have one at home. Well, needless to say, I'm surrounded by them. You know, usually my phone is a more powerful computer than existed then when I was 19, et cetera, et cetera. So just a little anecdote, but I, I really enjoy telling that particular anecdote. It's a real story. And, and it just shows me how, um, how difficult it is to look into the future to then look back uh, and predict what's happened. But you know, I will answer your question from the perspective of what really matters to me um, as, a, as, as a person, but also as editor in chief of the journal. And so I will go back to our mission statement. The, the mission statement, which has not really changed in 150 years. And that word serve, so there's an interesting combination where we serve the research communities and, and by now by research, I, I mean this in the broadest sense, and it is likely to be broader than, than we do now. That's the direction in which we're going. Um, so we serve, but I hope that we also enable, that we can also lead scientific community by maybe precipitating opportunities, maybe bringing communities together. Um, these are wonderful opportunities that, that we can take advantage of, but we can't do it on our own. We, we can only do it with the research community. I, I see this very much as a partnership. Just as I see 
you know, my, my role in the journal is very much a partnership with all my colleagues, all the editors who handle manuscripts, who, who reporters who write the stories in the magazine part of uh, Nature. And, you know, sometimes I think of myself as a conductor of an orchestra, actually, where, you know, each individual knows um, perfectly how to play their instrument, but somehow um, I, I try and bring out Mm -hmm. more than just the sum of the parts that that, uh, that make up make up the orchestra. So I think um, if I can look back, you know, at, at this point when I retire, whenever it's going to be, if I can look back at nature sort of under my, my leadership, under my steer, and say that we really have enabled um, new um, things to emerge with the research community, We've made it easier for the research community to, to publish, uh, to influence decision makers, policy makers, actually maybe to broker those conversations, um, facilitate perhaps even um, convergence of, of new fields. Again, the multidisciplinary journal offers that, that opportunity. Um, and of course, you know, on the, on the more pragmatic level, um, we are very interested in um, working on and iterating what we today understand as a scientific paper, a format of a scientific paper. You know, you, you mentioned that word PDF at some point. I mean, PDF has been the, the format of choice in terms of file sharing for such a long time. And, and we know it's not perfect. We know that the, the, the makeup of scientific papers as we know, it, know them today is very rigid and constrained. And, and we, both the research community and the publishing community, have been talking for a very long time about um, trying to shake up that, the way in which we disseminate results. If we can play a part in this, um, you know, under, under my leadership, I, I would be, um, in a way that makes sense, of course, that it's appropriate to the needs of the research community, I would be very happy uh, then Maybe you can interview me again in 20 years and we'll see what happens. I wish for that opportunity. <laughs> um, but you know, just in closing, I, I want to say that uh, Nature, uh, Nature Publishing Group is very lucky to have you, as we are in the science community. Uh, those are laudable goals that you've outlined, and we're certainly cheering for that to be uh, achievable. Uh, I'm sure it Thank will. Thank you. And uh, I, I want to say it's been a joy to have this uh, conversation with you to get your views, some, a lot of candid thoughts. Uh, there's no question that uh, if you go back to that 150 years, this guy has got to be uh, the hardest time to navigate through all the challenges that didn't exist even just five or 10 years ago, no less today. So thanks so much for having this uh, in-depth uh, conversation with me, Magdalena. I look forward to reconvening whether it's a decade or, or two from now. <laughs> Thank you very much, Eric. It's a real pleasure. Thank you.